The hidden story of this talk begins with what I initially thought would be fairly standard research into the history of my family home, specifically into the people who live there. I want to warn you now, now though, that this talk does contain discussion of potentially distressing events, namely that of poor health and suicide. Now, as I was conducting a house history, I looked at various land records, um, as well as what we might consider standard genealogical records. So I found the land registry entry for my house and was able to locate the names of people who had owned the land before the house was built in the 1930s. I also found the name of the very first occupants of the house as well. Other records such as tithe records, uh, civil registration, birth, marriage and death records, parish registers, uh, census records and newspapers were all used here. Bear in mind, though, that I initially performed this research during COVID, and so I was limited to what I could access. It was online records only. Uh, I hope one day that I might be able to expand this research into other sources. Now, the newspaper records in particular were most fruitful and really worth looking at for a local property. What I wasn't prepared for, though, uh, was an unexpected story of poor health and unfortunately suicide as a possible result. Now, the owners of the land are another story, but the very first occupants of my house appeared in 1937 and they were Barton Henry Way and his wife Florence, who was born Florence Stiles. The house in question, you can see on the slide here, is located between what would historically have been a sort of no man's land between Yeovil in Somerset and the village of Preston Plucknett. So you can see Yeovil in the wider context of the southwest and also the general location of the house in Yeovil. I have a timeline here of Barton's life for you to have a look at while I speak, um, as there isn't really time to go in depth into Barton's family history. But suffice to say, Barton was born in 1893 in Down St Mary in Devon, and his father George had worked for the railways, specifically the London and South Western Company, and he was originally from Crickern in Somerset. Both of Barton's brothers were also born in Crickham, so it is quite possible that George's children were born in places where he worked. Uh, George's employer had stations in both Crookham and Exeter, and this happens to be where Barton married Florence in 1916, so Exeter and Devon. And their son, Gordon Barton Way, he came along in 1920 and he was born in Yeovil. Now, you would be right to wonder how Barton came to live in Yeovil. We know that as a child uh, he had lived with his family in Crookern and in Devon and they do seem to have travelled between stops on the Salisbury to Exeter railway line so perhaps a final destination of Yeovil is not so unusual. Barton himself began life as librarian before his marriage and had graduated to accountant for the notable Yeovil firm of solicitors, Newman Painter & Co of Henford, and that was just before his son's birth. And the new family actually travelled between several addresses in Yeovil until they settled in my house on the edge of Yeovil in 1937. Now this information is all very superficial, um, and so it took a little more digging to actually uncover what was really going on and the full story here. Now, there were clearly interesting times, at least in Barton's life. Uh, he appears in a newspaper article in the Western Chronicle in April of 1923. And this particular article to us might seem pretty unnewsworthy these days. Um, but Barton was actually a witness in a bread theft. Um, one Leonard Alfred Wheel was accused of stealing a loaf of bread from a baker's van outside of a shop in Middle Street in Yeovil. Now Barton, who was living in Mitchellmore Road at that point, uh, saw the whole thing and saw the accused and a companion take a loaf of bread from the van. Now Barton then went into the shop and uh, warned the proprietor whereupon the men disappeared, one up Vicarage Street and one up Silver Street. And these are all streets which I recognise in Yeovil now as well. Now, according to Leonard Wheel, he had not really stolen the bread. Oh no, he only pretended to 
uh, as he already had some in his coat. A likely story, I think you'll agree. But whatever the outcome, uh, Barton was the material witness to an incredibly heinous crime. <laughs> now, you'll realise I'm making light of this, um, perhaps more than you might expect. Um, as this, but I make light of this as it feels like some light in Barton's life. This is something that descendants would find interesting and, and perhaps amusing today. And the reason I make such light of this is because Barton's life sadly got became very much harder. In 1939, um, Barton actually underwent surgery to remove a malignant growth, which is implied as being cancer. Um, and although Barton appears to have physically recovered from this, and indeed continued to work and attend functions on behalf of his employers, all may have not have been as it seemed. Um, in early August 1947, Barton sadly committed suicide and was found deceased at the desk in his office at work. Now, as you might imagine, the newspapers of the time were full of details, which is perhaps no different to, uh, to what would happen today. But the part that really stayed with me, though, is that it was thought necessary to state that a partner in the firm said that Barton was a perfectly honest person. And this really implies that his suicide could have been, you know, the, the thought was that his suicide was due to a guilty conscience and dishonesty at work, or at least there was potential for that to be the case. Now, that must have been terrible for his wife and son to endure. Um, but thinking about it, would it really be any different today? Perhaps not. But the fact that only one of his colleagues thought Barton had been depressed since his health worries is perhaps quite telling. It may shed a little more light on wider societal views of depression and mental health at the time, and perhaps a certain desire to ignore potentially these sorts of issues, or perhaps um, some denial of an event which probably would have carried a great deal of stigma with it. Um, it, it certainly can do for some people today as well. Now, this is partly supposition, of course, but perhaps you can imagine what a shock it was for me to find uh, this event in the course of my research. I certainly was not expecting a discovery of this nature. But what I did have to do was consider how I tackled this, especially if I was to share my findings. Uh, I initially wrote a blog post about this research and made the decision to ensure that I did not identify any living individuals. There may well be descendants of Barton and his son um, who could still feel the pain and sadness and difficulty of this event. There is a fine line to tread um, when you discover an event such as this, one which I'm always discussing with my clients so that they can be prepared and given the choice not to know if they really wish not to be. Um, but I think that that's a whole other topic of discussion, you know, whether uh, clients are informed or whether they should be or should not be. And that's something that we will discuss um, with our students on the Strathclyde course uh, at great length. But I suppose I do approach my own research from a similar standpoint as in my client research in, you know, as a member of the RQG and APG as well. I'm very aware that I am bound uh, to not omit information found due to their own terms and conditions for being a member. And so I felt as if I was duty bound to report all of my findings, even though they are potentially distressing. And I think for me, that meant writing about the event as a whole, but considering the language I was used when writing to ensure that I was respectful of the family. On the other hand, it also meant warning the reader of what they might find so that they could be prepared or choose not to read on if they so felt that way. And events of this nature can obviously be very difficult to read about, especially if you have first hand knowledge of, in your own life. As researchers, sometimes uh, we might forget the emotional impact of our research. I know I tend to compartmentalise as I might not be as effective in my job if I really felt the emotional impact of all these events whilst I was actually um, researching them. Um, perhaps if I was writing this again now, I might be a little bit more specific um, and a little bit more clear earlier in the post so that readers could be even better informed. <laughs> 
Now, um, there is, of course, a much larger discussion on ethics, which there is not time for here. Um, but the point I hope I've gotten across is that we as researchers can find unexpected and distressing events at any time in our research, whether that be concerning land and places, genealogical research or general historical research. Any time where people are involved, there is the potential for unexpected or distressing events to be uncovered. We just need to both prepare ourselves um, that this might happen, and as well as preparing our readers and remembering to be sensitive and respectful to the individual concerned and their descendants. I just have some contact details um, on this last slide for me through both the University um, of Strathclyde and my own business. So please do feel free uh, to get in touch. Thank you.